cool. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, I'm Matt with Uphill Pursuits. Uh, we're going to get started here in just a minute. Before we do that, got just a couple announcements. Uh, first of all, on the conference side, just make sure you're muted and uh, turn your camera off uh, for the bandwidth. Uh, this is going to be a little more interactive. Dave's going to answer questions as they come along. Um, use the chat box. Go ahead and type something in. Um, if it's relevant to kind of what's going on right there, we'll we'll get that question answered. If not, we'll save them for the end, and he'll it'll take some time to answer some more questions uh, when we get there. So a couple announcements on our end. Uh, Bearskin Schemo Race Series is going on. We've had two races now. We've got three more to go in the series, uh, happening every other Wednesday, uh, starting again, not this week, but next week. We do have a schemo and backcountry skills clinic uh, that's happening this Wednesday up at the Bear Canyon ski area. Uh, there is still spaces available uh, if you sign up. It's $15 per person, and that also includes the use of demo gear if you need it. So whether that's race gear or uh, just backcountry stuff, we'll do some in-the-classroom stuff and then actually get you out on the snow and get you a chance to play around with some touring gear if you're new to that, practice some transitions and do some fun things like that. So. Uh, go to the Montana Mountaineering Association webpage uh, to sign up. Uh, the info is there. And then finally, we're just kind of making a stewardship call out to everybody. And uh, there's more people being out and about on the trails. And with that comes a lot more usage. And things are getting, uh, they're busy in spots. One of them in particular is the Bear Canyon area. It's, it's pretty awesome that they allow people to be up there in the room. Um, they really have kind of let people scan there and kind of be there. Uh, but that comes with taking care of it. There's been some vandalism that's happened on the property, uh, as well as the parking lots are getting really full and people are actually parking on the roads and blocking some of the driveways and making it really difficult for the folks that live up there. So we're just asking everybody this year, as you're starting to get out there more, you see a lot of cars at a trailhead, it's full, maybe go somewhere else for the day or, or come back later and really make sure that you're taking care of the land um, especially up in the Bear Canyon area, because it's really awesome that they let us use that. So that's our public service announcement there. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dave here in just a minute. Uh, you know, given the state of the snowpack this year and the avalanche accidents that have been happening, uh, it's really relevant to, to try to get an opportunity to get some conversation here going. And Dave's going to present on kind of what they're seeing in the snowpack and how to really be able to kind of make smart decisions when you're out there in the backcountry and use the information that exists. And we're, this is a really awesome opportunity that we have here to have one of our local forecasters uh, be on this presentation, answer your questions and kind of get more information. So uh, we're super appreciative of, of them kind of taking the time and making themselves available for the community like this. This is really awesome. So a big thanks to Dave and the crew over there at the uh, National Forest Avalanche Center. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to D Dave Zinn and uh, he's gonna take it away. It's all you, Dave. All right, Matt, thanks for that introduction. And welcome everybody. Thanks for spending a Monday evening with me. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about this evening is the kind of what you signed up for is learning about this strategic perspective about how to use avalanche train, how to travel through the mountains safely in the backcountry safely. Unfortunately for you, or perhaps fortunately for you, I'm gonna start with the basics. And the reality is, is that the fundamentals of avalanche safety save lives. So far this year, we've had 31 avalanche fatalities. We're on track. If the, the average, average number of deaths occur from here to the end of the season, we're on track to hit 40 avalanche deaths for the first time since the 1925-26 season. And that's a time when railway crews and highway crews are getting buried in avalanches, not recreationalists. So the first time in over 85 years. All right, and I know another thing we like to do is, as old guys and girls, we like, to, we like to blame those darn kids, but that's actually not who's getting caught in avalanches and dying this year. The median age for folks caught in avalanches this year is 47 years old. And we have many groups that have lots of backcountry experience that are getting caught and killed in avalanches. So the fundamentals matter and the fundamentals save lives. 
where I'm going to start with this is making sure I, we, we can all recognize avalanche terrain and recognize where we are relative to that terrain. Once we can do that, we can follow the number one rule of traveling through avalanche terrain, and that's exposing only one person to it at a time to the hazard. I'll touch on the, the equipment, training, forecast, and keeping your eyes and ears open for signs of instability. Oh, it just changes. That's so cool. Um, we have some folks that are unmuted. If I could have everybody mute themselves, that'd be helpful. All right. So I'll touch on I'll touch on the equipment training forecast and keeping your eyes and ears open for signs of instability. But really what I'm gonna focus on is avalanche terrain or exposure to that terrain, and then strategic mindsets to travel safely based on the big picture. So the point here in this diagram is that steepness matters. Steepness is the most important terrain factor when it comes to avalanches. And when we're talking about slab avalanches, which is really the type of avalanche that kills people in the Rocky Mountains, we're talking about slope angles between 30 and 45 degrees. This is challenging because a 33 degree slope, a slope in the low 30s, is doesn't seem very steep to advanced skiers and riders, but it's steep enough for an avalanche. Slopes less than 30 degrees, there's too many frictional forces in play, and we generally don't see slides there. Sometimes we do, there are some exceptional cases. And then in the steeper terrain, slopes steeper than 45 degrees, snow doesn't have the chance to build up to this critical slab depth where we can have large avalanches because it's continually, continually, yeah, continually sliding down the mountain in small sloughs. Now those can be dangerous in their own right because they can knock us off cliffs or into trees, but they tend not to be the type of avalanche that buries us deep under the snow. There's probably a few of you out there that are just like, aha, I found the loophole. I'm just going to ski really steep terrain. Now, fair enough, that is a plan, but unfortunately, eventually, you're going to have to join the rest of us on flat ground. And when you do that, you tend to go right through this power band of 30 to 45 degrees where slab avalanches occur. So there's a black and white component to this and then a bit of gray. The black and white component, the, what, where I'll start, is that when we're referring to avalanche terrain, we're including all of this. We're including 30 to 45 degrees where those slab, avalanche ha slab avalanches happen. When we write about avalanche terrain in the forecast, this is what we're talking about. When we say, or we, when we suggest that people avoid avalanche terrain or avoid slopes underneath avalanche terrain, we're talking about the full range here. Now you're fr feel free to ignore our suggestion, but that's what, that's what we're actually suggesting. Now the gray area here, is that within this band, within this 30 to 45 degree band, we also know that most avalanches occur in an even smaller band. There's a huge percentage of avalanches that occur between 37 and 39 degrees in that upper level of the 30 degree range. All right, that is, that is true. So the lower angle you go, the fewer avalanches we see. 35 degree train, there's fewer, and 30 degree train, fewer still. That said, on years like this, where we have widespread persistent weak layers, so we have a depth hoar problem, we have sugary depth hoar, it's a weak layer, and it's remarkably weak this year, and it's really consistent from the Bridger Range, through the Gallatin Madison Range, all the way through West Yellowstone and much of the Rocky Mountain West. 
when those persistent weak layers are in play, all bets are off. Avalanches in the low 30 degree range, that's a persistent weak layer problem. So this year alone, to illustrate that, just as a bit of information, there have been nine fatalities that have occurred between slope angles of 30 and 35 degrees. Six of those spread across two events were in the low 30 degree range. So I think there's a perception that is like, well, if we're just, if we're just touching the edge of avalanche terrain, if we're in that 31, 32, 33 degree range, that's like pretty much safe. In years like this, it's it's a bit of a gamble. All right, we're we're just rolling the dice on that one. All right. The other gray area is that it's not just the train that we're standing on that matters. We know that most avalanches are going to start in that upper 30 degree range. But if we're connected to that train, so if we're below that train in 25 degree on a 25 degree slope, or we're beside that terrain on slopes in the high 20 degrees, we can collapse a weak layer that's connected to the steeper train. The avalanche can propagate up the slope and across the slope. And the whole thing it may start in that steep train, but the whole slope can shatter like a pane of glass and we can come tumbling down. So there are other clues besides slope angle that are helpful. Vegetation is one of them. We can see this tree here. Well, it turns out it didn't just grow with no branches on the lower half of it. It also didn't grow with branches just on the downhill side of it. Avalanches came through, knocked those tree branches off. Other, other avalanche paths look like they're cut ski runs because they slide and they pull the trees or knock the trees down in their in their path. So vegetation can be a good clue as to where avalanche terrain is, especially to where runouts zones are, where the avalanche will come to a stop. Existence of trees does not alone mean that an avalanche path is safe or a steep slope is stay safe. This is the site of a fatal avalanche that happened a little over two years ago in the tobacco roots. And a group was skinning up through these trees here. They st started to get spread out. This is a 40 degree slope, collapsed the slope, propagated all through the trees and came down and killed one. So if the trees are in place, and we have a steep slope, it can actually exacerbate the problem. Right. A good general rule on that is if there's enough room to ski successfully, have fun as you're sliding through the trees, probably enough room for an avalanche to take place. Other exacerbating factors that can make the consequences worse than they might be otherwise are gullies, where we'd be buried deeply, extreme or steep terrain, or it could be knocked off cliffs or where a small slide or a small fall has big consequences. And then just large paths where we're dealing with big volumes of snow, high, high sliding speeds and, uh, and long distances. All right, so we're talking about slope angle as the most important critical piece of information. The way we get slope angle is measuring it. We have to get our inclinometers out. We have to measure slopes because the mat a matter of five degrees is the difference between an avalanche or not an avalanche, right? 29 degrees versus 34 degrees. Totally different scene. So we've got to have an inclinometer and we've got to use it. I was talking to Doug earlier today and we're saying, sort of hypothesizing, if you could have one resource, only one resource, so you got to choose, you could have a partner, 
you can have a beacon, you can have a shovel, you can have a probe, you have anything that you want to travel safely through avalanche terrain. You might do worse than choosing an inclinometer because if you can keep yourself on lower angle slopes and out away from sl steep slopes, then you're going to do pretty darn well. The, the suggestion that I would have for folks is have the inclinometer and then carry it in your pocket. Uh, I have mine in my pants pocket. I'm always wearing those most of the time when I'm in the backcountry at least. Um, and then I can always get my grab my inclinometer, get a quick slope angle, and make adjustments as necessary. All right. There's some other tools out there for route finding and trip planning, and they're great tools. This is super cool stuff. The, the map overlays with slope angles that shade different slope angles to let you know if you're gonna be in steeper terrain, flatter terrain, where you are relative to avalanches, great tools. But it's really important that we understand the limitations to them. And that includes the old school tools as well, like maps. There are limitations just based on what they're trying to tell us. So the image that you see here, there's two maps. It's actually the same section of terrain. And this is the site of uh, the Silverton Avalanche fatality that occurred about two years ago. And you can see there's the contour lines. Those are 40 foot interval contour lines. This map on the left, hopefully it's on your left as well as my left. Um, this map on the left is using a standard, standardly available map overlay, and it uses a 10 meter digital elevation model. And the digital elevation model is basically how these things work. And the interval between points is 10 meters. You need three points to get a slope angle. So that means you're dealing with slope. To get a slope, you need 60 feet of terrain, linear terrain. The map on the right, same map, but instead of using that 10 meter DEM or digital elevation model, they're using a three meter DEM. So much more accurate. Now they can get a slope angle over 18 feet rather than 60 feet. So the point here is not that the tools don't work. The point is that we need to understand that what they're telling us, whether you're looking at contour lines or whether you're looking at these map over, digital map overlays, they're giving us relative slope angles and average slope angles. So we miss some of the fine details. Their plan, their trip plan, this blue dotted line actually made a lot of sense when you look at this 10 meter DEM. But when you take a look at the three meter DEM, a higher resolution of the same slope angles, you can see that rather than being in 27 to 29 degrees terrain like they were hoping to be and touching a corner of 30 and 31 degree terrain, they were in fact in a significant amount of 32 to 45 degree terrain. This red, the darker orange and red is all well into the, the band of avalanche terrain. And what ended up happening is they got caught and one person was killed. So the point here is that we need to verify slope angles on the ground. We need to get in-person, real-time, real-life slope angles. The other part of that is understand that the, the cheaper inclinometers, there's a little bit of margin for error built into those too. So I'll speak for myself, I won't speak for you, but I'd like to have a little bit of buffer between myself and a possible avalanche. So if you're, if you're thinking avalanches today, I need to stay out of avalanche terrain. I need to stay under 30 degrees. I personally am not trying to ski 29 and a half degree slopes. I might push, pull it back to 25 degree, 25 degree slopes. Give yourself a margin for error there. So 
now that we understand avalanche terrain, we understand some of the tools that we can use to get slope angles and how important it is to have accurate assessment of slope angles, we need to remember that number one rule of traveling through avalanche country, and that's exposing only one person at a time to the avalanche hazard. And that that is that applies for both the uphill portion and the downhill portion. So if you're setting a skin track, it's often impractical to say, all right, you're gonna go up to the top of this mountain and just wait there for 45 minutes while I then skin up, right? So that means our skin tracks really need to be outside of avalanche terrain. One of the things that can be really dangerous and suck us in without, without really thinking about it is following skin tracks. Really easy to follow a skin track. And you're just like, oh, well, these folks must know where they're going. Don't assume that. I was just at Mount Ellis uh, a couple weeks ago and I was following a skin track and I was like, oh yes, this is fantastic. Somebody was here before me, they broke the trail in, and I'm really happy that I don't have to break the trail all the way to the top of Mount Ellis. As we were doing the last little climb toward the, the saddle, the, the skin track was one ridge over from where I normally climb up. I was ascending the skin track and all of a sudden the alarm bells started going off. This, this feels steeper than I was planning on. That's one of the good things about having your inclinometer in your pocket you pull it out often, you practice with it often, and you can start to get this feel for the steepness of terrain that you're in. Now, I'm not saying that I know the difference between a 30 and a 32 degree slope by sight, but as it starts to get steeper, I'm, I can recognize pretty easily because I've practiced with my inclinometer that, boy, this doesn't, this doesn't seem quite right anymore. It seems a little steep. So pulled out my inclinometer and it was 33 degrees. And on that day, it was higher avalanche danger and decided, oh, we'll, we'll try it for a, a little bit longer, see if it eases off, but I think it gets steeper up here. It did. So what we did as a group, we made the decision to pull the plug on that skin track. We descended about 150 vertical feet so we could cross the a steep walled gully, a train trap in a safer place. And then we broke our own trail where I normally put the skin track. So just understand that just because you're following a track doesn't necessarily mean the track is in a good place. All right. This year so far, uh, either nine or 11 of the 31 fatalities, they occurred while groups were climbing uphill. There's some discrepancy there because there was one party of two where both the both people in the group got buried. And so it's unknown. It's suspected that they were climbing uphill when they got caught, but it's unknown. So this final point, some places you may not have the, the option to put the skin track outside, entirely outside of avalanche terrain. So if that's the case, if you're choosing to put multiple people on a slope simultaneously and that slope is above 30 degrees then you better be really sure that there's not instabilities that you're concerned about you better be really sure that there's not going to be an avalanche and now now we're talking about a snowpack evaluation question rather than a slope angle question So the reason why I'm bringing up and hammering this one at a time thing, this is pretty wild, wild stuff and it's really sad stuff. Since this year, since January 30th, there's been 24, 25 fatalities now. Um, there's just another one last weekend or two, two last weekend. Um, if we did one thing, one thing only, we only had one person get caught at a time. So I'm not talking about we we don't have beacons, we're not adding shovels or probes, we're not doing any fancy snowpack assessment. If we 
only do one thing and expose only one person at a time to steep slopes, we can reduce the number, we could have reduced the number of avalanche deaths by about 30%. That's 30% by doing nothing besides exposing one person at a time. There's potentially more saves that could have happened because if we bury or partially bury multiple members of the group, then we, we've effectively taken those folks out of position. They're out of play for any rescue. So I did, did some math and hypothetical math, but there's, there's a number of additional saves that could have been made if parts of the group hadn't been buried. So no avalanche train, know when you're in avalanche train, know when you're below avalanche train, and when you're, when you're in those positions or traveling one at a time, other members of the group are in safe position. So I promised you I'd touch on the other basics. It's gonna be quick. Uh, just remember, if we're traveling through steep snow-covered mountains, there's some fundamental things that should happen before we go, and that's getting the equipment. We need to have, well, don't, I'm not gonna say we need, we should have, nobody's forcing you. We should have a beacon, an avalanche probe, and an avalanche shovel. If you're rocking one of those super old analog beacons that just gets you up the ridge at the at Ridger Bowl or just on Slushman's Lift, probably time to replace it. So modern, dig, modern, modern three antenna digital beacon, metal, metal shovel, and an avalanche probe. When you have that gear, we wanna get the training. An avalanche awareness class is a great place to start, but really what we want folks to do is get a class that has some level of field component. With that field component, you'll learn about how to recognize avalanche train in, in the field, in the, in the situation where you might be. Some snow assessment tools, some rescue rescue skills, uh, really could be quite helpful and save somebody's life. And then every day you go out, checking the forecast locally. That's MT Avalanche, mtavalanche.com, and nationally you can find any avalanche center where there's a forecast published at avalanche.org. It's the National Avalanche Center website. On those forecasts, we'll start to tell you what to look for, how to look for it, and what to do about it. When you're out in the field, getting the picture means keeping your eyes and ears open, looking for signs of obvious instability. So the number one sign that the snowpack is unstable, recent avalanches, whether they be human triggered or natural. Either one, we know there's unstable snow. If there's collapsing or woomphing of the snowpack, if there's shooting cracks, um, or if you're starting to see weather that's contributing to rising instability. And finally, boy, I'm, I'm really coming back to this a lot, but get out, getting out of harm's way means exposing one person at a time to any given avalanche hazard and having people in position ready to go for the rescue. So this is this is what you actually showed up for. You didn't you didn't show, sign up to listen to me talk about the fundamentals. You t you, you asked you're just like I want to hear about strategic mindsets. I want to hear about strategies to travel through the mountains safely. So we'll get into that now. First thing I want to clarify is what the difference between strategy and tactics are. Strategy is the big picture. You're including all the information, and that might include the forecast. It might include recent avalanche activity or recent red flags in an area, information that you can find from the fork avalanche forecast. Uh, types, the type of instability that you're expecting, is that a persistent weak layer problem or is that a new snow problem? Wind slabs, what is it? All right, what, what the weather is doing, is the weather contributing to rising instability? and then your past observations of an area. And so what we're trying to figure out is, should we 
do something based on the big picture rather than the tactics of how are we going to do something. So the strategic mindsets, and this is not something I invented. This is a lot of guides use this in their daily planning. The strategic mindsets, there's four of them. The first is this initial assessment or uh, information gathering mindset. And as forecasters, that's largely what we're doing, right? We're not sure what the, the snowpack looks like. We wanna know what the snowpack looks like. So we're generally gonna stay out of avalanche terrain. We're gonna look around, we're gonna search for instability, we're gonna dig in the snow, and we're gonna try to figure it out. We can do this without exposing ourselves to avalanche hazard. The second mindset that we might have is a status quo mindset. That status quo mindset means that what we're doing seems appropriate for the conditions. We're right now staying, for example, staying out of avalanche train. We're keeping our slope angles under 30 degrees. That seems appropriate for the conditions and the weak layers that are in play. And there's no change that's advisable or needed. One note here is be, beware of the creep. That's, that's not the guy in the picture. That's beware of creeping into train that isn't part of your status quo. Remember that the difference between 29 and 31 degrees is barely perceptible as you're skiing or riding. So if all of a sudden you creep up and up and now all of a sudden you're at 33, 34 degrees, you may think you're in the status quo phase, but you've definitely changed what you're doing. The third mind step we call stepping back. And what this means is that new snow, wind, or new information necessitates more conservative train choices. And that may necessitate more conservative choices for a period of days, or it may mean for a month. We have a new weak layer that's really in play, and we're not going to be in avalanche train net for, for now. And the last is stepping out. And that means that a prolonged period of avalanche inactivity or a lack of persistent weak layers suggests that more aggressive terrain selection may be safe after further assessment. All right. Remember, we're always we're always looking for reasons to not go be more aggressive in our train selection. Now I put this picture up because we're talking about these strategic mindsets, but I would bet there's some folks out there that's like, wow, strategic mindsets, blah, blah, blah. Look at that powder skiing. You know, if, if we were in a live audience, I'd have you raise your hand, be like some people like, oh yeah, that's, I was looking at the powder, powder skiing. That looks really sweet. So it's important to think about these strategic mindsets before you're in the, the heat of the moment where you're staring up at a, gr a great looking powder run. All right, so this is this is something that we're doing before our trip. And what we're trying to do based on our strategic mindset is categorize terrain. And we're we may be categorizing specific slopes and saying, okay, well, today Saddle Peak is is off limits or something lower angle, maybe Bradley's Meadow is off limits. I don't know. Um, that's the red light train for the day. We're trying to think about that marginal train, the tr train that should be okay based on the big picture, but we're going to do some further assessment and then we're identifying green light train. And that's, that's sort of the, the meat and potatoes of what we're going to be riding and skiing in, during the day. All right. The other way we can think about this rather than specific slopes is specific types of terrain. So let's say there's generally safe avalanche conditions. There's not right now, but we can always wish. So generally safe avalanche conditions, but we know that there's some small small wind slabs, some small drifts of snow that might avalanche in steep or extreme terrain. And I know that my risk tolerance doesn't want doesn't allow me to 
feel comfortable getting pushed off a cliff or through trees. So I'm going to say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to stay out of high consequence, steep terrain. I'll ski an avalanche terrain. That'll be my yellow light conditions, but not the, not stuff with train traps. And then my green light train in good avalanche conditions might be anything under 35 degrees, for example. What we're gonna, what we're gonna do with this train is, if we have green light, we're gonna utilize all of our our standard safety protocols. So we carry our avalanche rescue gear, we travel one at a time, we keep our ears and eyes open for any signs of instability that could turn us around. You want to onboard any new information, and we can always choose to be more conservative with our trip planning. It's easy to do. We're always looking for the no rather than the yes, the reason to not go forward. In our yellow light terrain, the way I like to explain this is it's not like I'm pushing right up to the boundary of where an avalanche is going to occur. If that's yellow light in my mind, it's terrain that I think should be safe. It's based on the big picture, based on the forecast based on the type of weak layers, based on the new snow and wind, based on recent avalanche activity, this yellow light train should be okay. But we're starting to push it a little bit. So what we wanna do is search for the instability, search for reasons to turn around and bail, and use really good snowpack assessment tools as a way to hunt for the unanticipated st instabilities. Our red light terrain, that's our no-go terrain for the day. Whether we're saying my no-go terrain is anything over 30 degrees or 35 degrees, or whether we're saying I don't want to get caught in a small avalanche and steep terrain, steep or extreme terrain if it's high or I'm sorry, low avalanche danger. So we're defining what our no-go terrain is. Now, the important thing here is that we're doing this not in the heat of the moment, not while we're staring at the sweet powder run. And so it's important that we don't ignore our carefully crafted strategy while we're out in the field. Right. So we'll talk about how snow pits fit in, what they can tell us, what they can't tell us, um, or the subtitle, don't hang it all in a snow pit. So we're we'll watch a quick video here. unremarkable all right so <clears throat> tell you a little story about young Dave started to get into the backcountry and I was told as many of you probably were that I should dig snow pits at the time it was roosh blocks and compression tests that we did to try to determine stability uh, so I would dig my hole in the snow take my shell out, I'd bang on the snow, I'd poke and prod the snow, and I'd get a result. Then I would invariably scratch my head and say, all right, well, does that mean I get to ski it or not? What I'm going to tell you is that entire mindset, that entire way of thinking about snow pits was wrong. A snow pit can't tell us that something's safe. It can only tell us when something's not safe. So if you want a decent rule of the way to think about your test results, these extended column tests are a great test to use uh, because they test both failure and the ability of that failure to spread across the column. column. And that's, those two things are what we need to have an avalanche. We need failure and then we need propagation. So a decent rule is, if you get propagation in your 
extended column test, that failure spreads across the column, that's a no-go. That's an unstable result. If you don't get propagation, a decent thing to assume is, well, if the train fits into my understanding of a safe decision based on the bigger picture, including the forecast, recent weather, recent avalanche activity, and recent red flags, and I haven't, then I guess I haven't found a reason to turn around yet. It's a little more complicated, but it does. The point is, we're searching for instability, not stability. Another point on this is if you don't find a instability that we're talking about in the in the forecast, and you're saying, and you're going to say this slope is stable because I didn't find it, you better look again. It's if you're going to hang it on a snow pit, if you're going to hang it on the results of your stability test, then you better look pretty hard to find those instabilities, especially with those instabilities like this year, where we know are really widespread. So if you're gonna, if do you can do the pre -mor do the pre mortem, you can say, all right, so I'm gonna ski this steep slope because I don't think there's deeply buried weak facets on the ground, and you get caught in an avalanche, and then picture yourself talking to Doug Chabot, the avalanche sheriff. He's not the sheriff. He's not law enforcement. Don't let him fool you. Um, but you're you're talking to Doug, and he says, "All right, so let me get this straight. You read the forecast this morning." I say, "Yeah, I read the you said it. I read the forecast this morning." And all right, so let me get this. You, you went into the backcountry after reading the forecast. You so you knew about the widespread weak layer of facets near the ground. Yep, I knew about that. And, and you dug a snow pit and you didn't find those facets. You're just like, yeah, I didn't find them. So even though we, we said they're, they're all over the place, it's widespread, yeah, didn't find them, they weren't there. And then you went on to a 37 degree slope and you triggered an avalanche. Yeah, that's what happened. And you triggered an avalanche on these facets. Just remember that when you're digging a snow pit, you are testing basically a three by three square foot area. So you have a really small yeah, I'm just trying data. to text you. I'm trying to sit on this avalanche class. It's only for like 15 minutes. Got some, got some folks off of off of mute. If folks can mute themselves for again. Um so so just remember you you got a small data point with with a snow pit and what we want folks to do is use that information and put it into the big picture rather than hanging it all in the snow pit all right hey, hey so Dave, we line, this yeah, is my, yeah we had a question in here it says should we dig in the shallowest snowpack to get conservative results or dig in something more representative um, yeah, that's a good question. So location location of snow pits is important. Um, that's a tricky question, but but well, it, here's here's what I'll say about it. First and foremost, when we're digging snow pits, we are digging snow pits in a safe location. Remember that you do not need to go on to, into avalanche terrain to dig a hole in the snow, to bang on the snow, to find out if you're going to trigger an avalanche. Your test results will work whether you're in avalanche train or whether you're on 15, 10 or 15 degree train. They work the same as long as the snowpack's the same. Um, to answer the question, if you think that there's going to be instabilities that you're going to find in a shallow area of the snowpack and you're worried about those areas on the, the slope that you're planning to ski, then yeah, you should dig in the, the place where you think you're going to find the instability. I, I investigated, I went into MACD Basin yesterday and I looked at uh, an avalanche there, the snowmobile triggered, and it tapered from about two and a half feet on the edges of the avalanche to 10 feet deep in the middle of the avalanche. There's no way that the snowmobilers would have triggered that avalanche if they had just stayed on the 10 foot deep part of the, the slab. 
they triggered it because they were on the shallow part of the slab. So there's no reason for me to go into the middle of a giant wind drift, a 10 foot deep wind drift, and start banging on the snow with an extended column test. It's not gonna, it's gonna tell me I got stable results. So look for the instability, hunt that out. Um, hopefully that answered the question. Um, so I guess, well, let me run through the bottom line on, on this stuff. And I think this is sort of reiterating what I just said, but we're looking for a no rather than a yes. And so, if, for example, you're gonna find the no in the shallow part of the shallow, weaker part of the snowpack, then look there. That's then you're doing your job, you're doing your homework well. All right, don't pin it all on your stability test. Use use that to integrate into the big picture. Focus on the instability rather than the stability. With our strategic thinking, think about should we do something based on the big picture rather than how should we do something? And think about your terrain options for the day, whether they be green light, yellow light, or red light, based on that initial assessment, information gathering mindset, a status quo mindset, a stepping out mindset, or a stepping back mindset. And lastly, uh, remember, remember, remember that fun the fundamentals save lives. Avalanche terrain at the margins of typical is still avalanche terrain. Uh, but my second year ski patrolling, we we had a really unique event where there was actually a, an avalanche triggered on a really low angle slope on a layer of surface for. So it can happen outside of that that typical range. It tends not to be it tends to be a really exceptional event. Um, but 30 to 45 degrees, that is slab avalanche terrain, and that's the, the zone that we need to be real careful with. When in doubt, measure your angles, confirm them on the ground, and think about the connected terrain. And lastly, think strategically rather than tactically. Um, I'm gonna change gears real quick, uh, just do a quick state of the snowpack. Hey Dave, and then I got a question. We got this is Matt again. We've got a question that kind of ties into that. Okay. Uh, before you kind of jump into the snowpack. Yeah. Um, and it's around the train kind of and mitigation and stuff. And it says uh, experienced users are pushing further out into more complex or less known terrain because of perceived pressure on less complex and easier access terrain by increasing numbers of users. What's your thoughts on that in regards to all the the kind of steps and checks and things that you had talked about. All right, I'm just re just reading the question in the chat box now. Thanks for bringing that okay. to my attention, Matt. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I think the the bottom line is that you're right now uh, based on the snowpack that we have. You're, you're not going to be able to outsmart the instabilities. These, these are deep, deeply buried, remarkably weak layers that are going to be with us for a big part of the season. So I see no reason to not push out into more distant terrain. However, I, w I am personally and wouldn't recommend pushing into more complex, steep avalanche terrain based on uh, pressure from other users. Sure, push out into far out, long distance tours where you're, you're still in sub 30 degree terrain um, until you have that initial assessment phase complete. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's answering the question. Uh, feel free to go out into, the tr out into the world, explore. We encourage that, we love that. We love it ourselves. We love to support people doing it for themselves. Um, just it still it still falls within that same metric, whether it's right next to the ski area boundary or whether it's 15 miles out. So, um, 
Matt, let me know if that doesn't answer your question. Um, Matt Madsen, other Matt, uh, did you see any other questions that needed a quick, quick answer before we go into the state of the snowpack? Uh, yeah, there was one that kind of talks about the snowpack, so we'll go to that one at the end, but it said, this one is how should you incorporate a forecast and snowpack test information when your AVI forecast covers an incredibly wide swath of area and several ranges? Yeah, uh, not dissimilar to the one that we exist in. Uh, the Gallatin National Forest Avalanche Center covers uh, many different ranges. We cover the Lionhead area, the Madison Range, it's divided up, and the Gallatin Range is divided up, the Bridger Range, and the mountains around Cook City. Um, I think one of the, the, the important thing here is to understand that what we're trying to do as a forecast center is give you the tools to look for the likely likely hazards. Uh, we're giving you the tools by telling you what weak layers that we've found, what avalanches are sliding on, and what the recent avalanche history has been. Uh, so in that, I think we have we have a really good network of observers, of citizen observers that are sending in information all the time. So not all these avalanches we find ourselves. A lot of them we get photos from Cook City. We get photos from Lionhead, the Madison Range, the Gallatin Range, the Bridgers, wherever it might be. We get information from the local ski patrols, um, and we integrate that into the the avalanche forecast product. Um, so hopefully, what comes through is a clear, concise, and accurate portrayal of the potential potential concerns that you'd be facing in the backcountry. All right. Um, Mason, if that didn't answer your question, definitely jump in and ask a follow-up question. Uh, appreciate the question. Thank you. Uh, so a quick state of the snowpack. Uh, the weak layer of depth horn facets that makes up the foundation of our snowpack for much of the advisory area, much of the advisory area from the bridgers through West Yellowstone is still widespread it's still in play and it's still weak, All right? It's gonna be that way for most of the season. Uh, ways that this can change, if we get lots and lots of snow and bury it very deeply, it will slowly gain strength, but not quickly. In the spring, as water starts percolating through the snowpack, it'll alternate between weak when it's wet and strong when it's frozen solid but plan on this weak layer being there. So if there's like midwinter high high consequence objectives that you have, this is a good year to dial those plans back. Uh, that's the bottom line on that. Um, right now we're seeing many slopes repeat, meaning that we're seeing avalanches that are breaking in the same place multiple times. We've seen it on Saddle Peak uh, where there's been numerous avalanches on the football field, from the summit uh, and right down the right down the gut. Uh, saw it on at MACT Basin just the other day. There's a small avalanche path right at the entrance to the basin that has avalanched already this year. So don't think to, just because something's avalanched already, it's it's done. Uh, in fact, the the 10 foot avalanche crown that I investigated yesterday, while we were there. The avalanche happens. The avalanche happened on Saturday. We were there Sunday, and there's already so much wind loading that there was about a one and a half to two foot deep pillow of snow that was sitting on the track of the avalanche. So it's already reloading. All right. Um, the next thing is that we're worried about this wind. It hasn't snowed in a few days, but as far as the snowpack is concerned it's been getting loaded continuously. We've been having 70 mile an hour gusts up at Ridgetop, especially in the Northern ranges. And there is a whole lot of soft snow to be blown around. And we're worried that we're shifting from this, this time frame where we're, it's easier to trigger avalanches to 
this time where maybe it's slightly harder, but those avalanches are gaining some serious destructive power and they'll be bigger, uh, not dissimilar to the the one I we, I saw on Sunday, it was 10 feet deep, but the potential for them to be much wider than that one is is very real. So we're entering deep slab avalanche season, which is a scary time. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much what I got there. And I will. Hey, David, say, Matt. We yeah. do have a question that kind of relates to the state of the snowpack, and it's it's yeah. what's your guess for the rest of the season with the persistent weak layer? Is this something that might get resolved in April as it warms up, or should we just expect everything to rip to the ground for the rest of the year? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna resort to my favorite non-committal answer on this and say it depends. Uh, it depends on what happens. It, we could bury it very deeply, so it's it's becomes less of an issue on a regular basis. Um, we could get some water that percolates through it and get gives it some strength over time. Uh, we could see large wet slab avalanches on it. So it really depends on how the weather contributes to the instabilities or not. Um, I, lo I love the non-answer, but there you go. Um, so I will say thanks for that. Thanks for joining me tonight. Um, if you have any other questions, I'm happy to take those live or answer them on the chat box. And then lastly, I'll put in this plug for sending in your observations to mtavalanche.com. There's a submit an, submit an observation button and we are your avalanche center and the, the resource only gets better as people contribute the information that they see out in the field. And one of the things that's really important to know is that what the a valuable comp a, a valuable contribution doesn't have to be a complicated one it might just mean you're out in the field and the sensors that we're using to determine snowfall were a little off compared to what you saw you, you're like you said it snowed five inches i found 15. that's really helpful for us to know it's really helpful to know hey i was up in highlight and i saw big plumes of snow blowing over the ridges it's wind loading quickly helpful to know if you want to send in snow pit results that's great if you want to send in photos of avalanches we love those and yeah uh, as a as a community as a team we'll just continue to make the products better and with that i will uh see if we have some good questions here Let's see. Um, I got a question about Goose Creek. I don't know the exact slope angles of Goose Creek, but is generally below 30 degrees. Um, so generally not generally safe place to be. Um, Maybe next time you go up there with your inclinometer, try to find that those steeper rollovers and figure out what those those avalanche or those slopes are, but less than 30 degrees. Oh, I, Mike came in to to answer that question. Thanks, Mike, in the chat box. I think I answered the persistent weak layer. What's the best guess for that? I answered, should we dig in the, the shallowest part of the snowpack to find the weak snow? Yes, find the instability. Got Mason's question. All right, this is a, this is a great question from Joseph. I haven't I haven't gotten to. He spent a lot of time talking about inclinometer use and the importance of slope angle evaluation. Most slopes have localized variation in angle that often briefly exceeds the 30 degree mark on otherwise safe steep slopes. How long does such a variation have to be distance wise to present a potential hazard? Uh, that really depends on the weak layer that we're dealing with. Uh, with persistent weak layer, not very much. Um, 
actually like I said, I saw that I saw one avalanche on a 23 degree slope uh, when I was ski patrolling up the Yellowstone Club, and this was a decade ago. But it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Persistent weak layers are are the real deal. It def definitely keeps us guessing, um, and it just depends on the avalanche danger. So if you're seeing big big obvious signs of instability. I'd say give yourself a margin for error. Um, but slopes don't, if, if most of the slope is in the mid 20s and there's just a small roll at 30, 30 plus degrees, uh, it's unlikely to take the whole slope with it. Um, that's kind of a non-answer. Sorry, Joseph, I'm, it sort of, sort of varies, but depending on the, the weak layer, but generally speaking, if you're near 30 at the steepest, if you're in the low 30s and most of the slope is less than that, you're gonna be fine. Um, what are your favorite inclinometer or AVI apps? Um, I'm kind of old school, I use maps. Uh, so USGS quads, I mean, I do have, have them on my phone, so I have the digital version as well. Um, and then the inclinometer, there's, I have a couple, I have one that's built into my compass, which I really like. And then um, I have one of the backcountry access ones, but really it's any inclinometer that gives you a good, good, good readout is great. Where can you find the shorter range of slope angles, 10 meter versus three meter? Uh, those are not, they're coming, but they're not widely available yet. Uh, so where, the question is, where can you find the, the tighter grid, the more detailed grid for the slope angle overlays, like I was showing in that comparison photo? Um, that was done after the ac accident with a LIDAR scan of the area. And so it was done specifically for that terrain. Um, in Switzerland, I was just talking to Carl today, and he was mentioning that they're actually working on a one meter grid for the digital elevation model. And that has the potential to be very accurate as, in terms of slope angle. So it's coming. Um, it's just something to be aware of. Um, but I think commercially, the 10 meter DEM is pretty standard at this point. Uh, what are the main green lights that I look for in order to ski bigger lines before the snowpack goes isothermal or stabilizes in the spring is what what we're asking there and stabilizes because of long-term melt freeze cycles. Uh, the big green lights are and the no in, no persistent weak layers, uh, no recent avalanche activity, and no recent signs of instability along with uh, no significant loading events and stable test results. So if I'm skiing big lines, I'm looking for all of the above. I want all those pieces to line up for me before I'm gonna commit to high consequence avalanche train. Uh, this is a good question and relevant to the recent time, but when investigating a new avalanche or a recent recent avalanche, how do you decide whether it's safe or not to go out underneath the crown? And what we're largely looking, how we determine that is we're looking at what we call hang fire. And the hang fire is the amount of snow that's left on a steep slope uphill of the crown. If the slope, if it broke right at the rollover and the terrain above the crown is not an avalanche terrain so it's less than 30 degrees and but that and that snow, snow is hanging there then we'd feel comfortable going to the crown if that snow that's hanging the crown is at a slope angle that's between 30 and 45 degrees and there's a large area of snow above the crown or where the avalanche broke then we would not feel comfortable going there um, and even when we feel comfortable we're still using uh, safe travel protocols going one at a time 
and minimizing our exposure. All right, I think I got all the questions in the chat box there. If there's any others, plug them in. Otherwise, I'll say thank you again and have a great night, a safe season, and send us your observations. Hey, Dave, I just yeah. want to say a huge thank you. Uh, this was kind of just, I think, what we needed and timely for everything that's going on. So this is huge. Uh, thanks for taking the time out of your evening and putting this together and answering people's questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's been, been a scary season. Um, we don't want to hit that that mark where we're hitting 40 fatalities this year uh, for the first time in many, many years since the 1925-26 season. So we'll stay safe out there and uh, just understand with the persistent weak layers that we have in play, we're largely keeping it conservative. And sometimes that those strategic mindsets are based on a, a seasonal snowpack rather than a daily snowpack. Awesome. So can I actually ask you a question? I have yeah, a question from the, from the social human perspective of this whole thing. So as a more experienced like user in the backcountry, what are ways that you can encourage like people that are in your group to make sure that they speak up when they see things or think things might not be aligned with what you want to try to do or go for for the day? Sure. Um, I think the the easiest way to encourage people with less experience or perceived less experience, I should say, to contribute to the conversation is, is make it simple and make it non-threatening. And the way you can do that is encourage people to ask why. So if they don't have a specific opinion or they don't have a specific concern, what we can do is say, it's like, hey, like if, if at any point I'm making, just explicitly say it at any point like i'm saying something that doesn't make sense or doesn't fit with what you perceive the snowpack or terrain to look like i encourage you to speak up and ask me why i'm thinking that and if you're not comfortable tell me that um, and sort of in the same way that like a helicopter crew often has one no means no go so the whole crew together can make this decision and then one person saying no i don't like it uh that's that's a decent reason to pull the plug um if it's if you're not sure ask why so i might say hey matt you're you're telling me that uh you feel comfortable skiing this 35 degree slope can you tell me why you feel comfortable skiing this 35 degree slope and doing that, just the, asking that simple question, forces the group to stop, rethink about what we're doing as a team, and it forces the perceived expert in this in this case to explain their work. And to say, well, and you and you may have a great reason. You may say, well, based on the snowpack, the lack of persistent weak layers, the lack of any avalanche activity recently, and the lack of any red flags in terms of instability. I feel comfortable skiing a 35 degree slope today. And I'd say, oh, wow, that was pretty well thought out. Um, if instead you said, ah, because I feel like it, because I want to ski this sweet powder, well, maybe that's not the best, th the most well thought out argument for why we should get, proceed. Uh, so asking why, asking questions is the, the best way that I can encourage folks that are, that are curious, unsure, to contribute to the the conversation. Awesome. Do you ever do like group check-ins along the way? I do group check-ins all the time. Cool. Um, and I also, as as an avalanche forecaster, we go out with partners. Sometimes there are other our, our teammates in the forecast center, and sometimes there are folks from their friends or whoever. And I just make sure to tell people it's like, hey, if if I'm doing something that seems stupid, please tell me. And then we'll reevaluate. And, you know, if there's a, ever a decision point where it's like, okay, well, I'm gonna cross this slope. Does this seem stupid to you? Um, I, I really want folks to speak up and, and let me know before I get caught in an avalanche. So that's one of, one of my checks and balances, because of my team. 
Awesome. Yeah, that human component is huge to the whole thing. So cool. Hey, Dave, thanks again so much for taking the time today. Um, this has been awesome. And for folks, uh, this has been recorded. And so we will get it cleaned up and put up on the YouTube channel. So this is going to be accessible for everybody to, to watch later on or share with your friends or family or whatever. So cool. Awesome, Matt. Well, thanks for thanks for inviting me and uh, look forward to chatting with you all soon. And we'll yeah, keep keep it keep up the good work and keep spreading the word about avalanche safety and we'll see you out in the in the backcountry, hopefully. Sounds great. And as always, if you need Avi gear or have questions, stop on in the shop. We've got that all and we can we can help you all out with that too. So awesome. All right.